Hi everyone, I am Nikunj, co-founder at True Foundry, and today we have a very special guest, Vincent, who actually works in the similar space as True Foundry. So we are super excited to chat with Vincent, uh, diving deep into uh, like you know what what he is doing at Snorkel AI, and uh, like you know um, we will we will talk a lot about MLOps, uh, data labeling, data like you know, model training, model deployment processes. So a lot of those things will will dive deep into today. Uh, Vincent is actually one of the founding engineers at Snorkel AI and uh, has worked in this space quite extensively. So I would love to invite you to our uh, True ML episode uh, and uh, please introduce yourself. Like you know, add more color to your introduction, um, Vincent, for the for the audience. Yeah, thank you so much, Nikunj, for the kind introduction, and super happy to be here to uh, talk to you, get to know you a little bit, and um, talk about ML, which. Um, you know, always, always happy to nerd out a little bit. Um, so as you mentioned, my name is Vincent. Um, I was a founding engineer here at Snorkel. And actually, I had started working on Snorkel back when it was still a research project at the Stanford AI Lab. I was a graduate student at the time working on the core systems and, and uh, applications of weak supervision and programmatic labeling, which was the academic genesis of what is today Snorkel AI, the, the, uh, the company. Um, Back then, I worked on a number of the kind of core systems um, around slicing and actually evaluating um, uh, models, and and you know very very relevant to to how we think about LLM evaluation and benchmarking today. And also worked on a number of applications across computer vision, medical imaging, and had some really cool experiencing uh, experiences partnering with say doctors of the medical school over at Stanford to really put the types of AI applications we were building with Snorkel into production at the time, which was um, a very, very rewarding experience. Um, so when I landed at Snorkel, I actually joined as a founding engineer. I led and built out our ML engineering team, which was responsible for actually going out into the field, applying our core technology, and really trying to generalize how this would apply to a broader data development platform. And so over the years, that was a very natural transition as we scale to move over to product more officially, where I've been helping build out the founding product and design teams and really um, scale out how we think about, hey, what does it really mean to be an AI data development platform for our enterprise customers? So, um, you know, happy to chat all things product, machine learning, um, and happy to be here today. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Actually, I did not know about the story around, like, you know, working on Snorkel, like, you know, as a research project early on. So, so very good to hear this. Uh, Vincent, uh, yeah. Vincent, help the audience orient for those who are not deeply familiar with Snorkel already about what do you what do you mean by this enterprise data platform, data centric AI, uh, right? And what is the positioning of Snorkel in the overall workflow of let's say a machine learning developer or like you know what are what are enterprises using you for? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the way I think about Snorkel is we're the AI data development platform for building production AI in the enterprise. And when I say data development, um, you know, I, I really mean all the steps of the workflow needed to evaluate, label, develop, curate data sets to actually train AI that's effective for enterprise use cases. There's a ton of really important parts of the ML workflow and stack. A lot of these are related to, say, um, model training, algorithms, inference, right? Doing all this really efficiently, um, with the right hyperparameters. And, and um, while this part of the st stack is really, really critical, what we tend to focus on here at Snorkel is all the data-centric components, right? Often what folks think of as the plumbing or janitorial work of AI development, we view as actually the highest leverage interface to actually program AI effectively. I view data as the actual main programming interface to build effective AI that aligns to, say, proprietary data sets or custom objectives of an enterprise. And our bet, our hypothesis, even back in the academic days, is that if we give teams of data scientists and their subject matter expert partners, think doctors, clinicians, underwriters, if we give these teams the tools to actually manage, curate, and label their data at scale, um, we actually really, really up-level their ability to program AI at large. And so our platform is really focused on helping enterprise teams do all of those types of operations in a collaborative way and in an enterprise-ready way so that you know you can actually get from prototype to production really efficiently. Nice. That's amazing. Um, uh, so, like, you know, would it... Uh, is it is it then fair to say that Snorkel's ma major focus is to the... Um, 
model building and to the left of it, basically, and when I say left of it, I mean like data preparation, feature engineering, um, data labeling, um, or we feel like Snorkel would, would also like you know, cover a lot on the right of it, which is like model deployment, model monitoring, uh, and the feedback loop closure. It's a great it's a great question. We we tend to primarily focus on the data development part of the stack. There are other modules of our platform that allow you to extend that our customers have, have uh, of course, leverage. But when I say data development, I really refer to what are those steps to actually developing your training data and programming it right with the right label, supervision, curating the right subsets that are actually going to be representative of slices, for example, that you care about in production. All of those pieces require active preparation, again, labeling, slicing, augmentation, filtering, all of those operations to actually build a high quality data set. That's our kind of primary uh, bread and butter um, that we then use to train models and drive feedback loops around um, iterating on that actual data set. Makes sense. And uh, like, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, like, you know, Snorkel further, but like just stepping back and going like a few years before and learning a bit more about you, right? So uh, tell us a little bit about your days at Stanford, like how you got into machine learning. Um, like, you know, it was, were there any courses that excited you? Were you like always like you, you knew that you want to be working in this in this overall field? Uh, just help us uh, understand your journey here better. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it it almost feels like an accident looking back now, but I was always really excited about building. I was really excited about the hackathon culture that was um, definitely at its peak when I was um, an undergrad. Um, was a big participant and organizer of Tree Hacks, actually the Stanford um, flagship hack hackathon back in the day, and helped you know put on the first version of that um, way back when. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, was really really excited about kind of programming, hacking, just the iteration cycles that you could get with building software in general. And my foray into AI and ML was really the idea that programming fundamentally was was changing. Right, I, I saw AI ML as a really exciting way to think about how different folks could actually start to you know th think about programming uh, folks that weren't namely uh, developers or software engineers um, because AI actually allowed folks to have a very different model for programming you know Andre Karpathy had a uh, really phenomenal blog post about this called software 2.0 but the way I think about it is you know in this new regime of AI you actually enable a type of programming which is focused on two things one is, the, the spec or the objective function, right? What do you actually want a model to learn? What is the output? What is the, again, um, outcome that you want the, the model to perform? What is that spec? And two, the data, right? How do you actually train that model with the right examples and supervision to um, achieve that outcome? And that's a very different programming model than what you might have had before, right? Where you're really in the code writing if if statements and and, and else statements about... Um, you know, what you need the model to do exactly. I was really excited about this new way of thinking about programming and software engineering in general. I was excited about how it could unlock all different types of programmers that, again, weren't traditionally software engineers. And so, you know, my foray into AIML really stemmed from the excitement about building things and the opportunity to extend that beyond, again, what you might traditionally call software engineering at the end of the day. Got it. Okay. And I guess being at being at Stanford in the right mix of like you know hackers, uh, hackers helped uh, fuel yeah, absolutely fuel this more. Makes sense. I think so. Yeah, like a lot of a lot of really fun energy um, with with folks at Stanford for sure. Nice. And uh, like you know, like uh, going through your LinkedIn, like you know, we've also seen that you have worked uh, or contributed quite a bit to Y Combinator as well as well. Like you know, in a part time capacity. Tell us a little bit more about that. Like what what was that role like and what yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I was just so hungry um, when I was when I was at Stanford to kind of um, be close to builders, people who were, you know, going zero to one. And so had an opportunity to kind of work more closely with YC at the time to help them spin up their, you know, campus programs. So would run office hours with, you know, student founders or, or folks who were thinking about starting companies um, with partners at YC, um, would run certain outreach events, right, where we would run workshops, right? Pitch your startup idea or, you know, workshop your your UI UX for your um, for, for an app or for a, for a project you were working on. Um, it was a really cool opportunity to get hands-on um, 
and and really just engage a little bit more deeply with the builder community at Sanford. So that's how I viewed it, and it was an awesome awesome opportunity to you know engage with uh, some of the best uh, in the field in terms of um, you know thinking about how to build zero to one. Got it. Okay. And uh, did this did this involve like you know um, besides like you know helping out found and and like I guess is this like you know you're working doing these office hours with like new founders who are joining the YC cohort? Is is that what you meant? It was a mix. Um, some of them were in YC cohorts and running programming for them. Sometimes it was more, hey, new potential founders who were looking to just get you know get their first step into AIML. A lot of it was intended to engage the student population more broadly. Um, so it was a little bit of a mix. Got it. Okay. And one other thing that stands out about your career is how you started, like you know, from machine learning, like focused primarily on leading the machine learning team at Snorkel. And then now you're leading the product and design. Now that's a shift that we don't see very commonly in the industry, right? So we'd love to understand like, uh, what was the motivation? What drove you to work move more towards product and design? Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. And you're right that, you know, I didn't I didn't always start out saying, hey, I want to, you know, eventually be a, a product leader in this capacity. Um, a lot of it really stemmed from the type of work that I was already doing. You know, at a startup, one of the one of my favorite um, phrases or or philosophies is, you know, at some point you have to give away your Legos or fire yourself and kind of move on to the next thing. This was very much a case of that, right? We were very early days. I was doing everything from building parts of the website to, you know, building our first version of our product, talking to customers, you know, flying out on sales expeditions, um, all, the, all the different hats that you wear at a startup. And as we scaled, I really found myself drawn to a few parts of the role. One, right, really still love the kind of technical um, deep dives that I got working with customers, really understanding what workflows we needed to provide to um, really help our customers um, drive and make more efficient the workflows that they you they they run through every single day, right? When they're trying to build AIML models um, on their end, I really loved actually engaging with customers directly as well. Right, very energizing to be at the cutting edge, working with folks who were very very motivated to put AI into production and had already sifted past all the kind of demo level capabilities and alternatives, and um, were really just hungry to figure out how to make this work in their production use cases. And so for me, product was a really exciting blend of both some of those technical workflow level uh, details, which, um, you know, as, as a researcher and ML, ML engineer at heart, you know, um, I was very, very close to, and also some of the customer facing pieces around really understanding, hey, how do we actually get this in your hand so that it's effective? What are the right capabilities to actually ha have you experience a step change in terms of workflow improvements? All that came together in a pretty exciting way um, in product uh, at, at Snorkel over the last few years. Got it. Okay. And you know, like this is such a, a deeply technical space that I can imagine that somebody like a product leader who does not come from like, you know, a machine learning background themselves might actually find it difficult to navigate like, you know, the product vision in the, in the company. So I'm, I'm sure that like, you know, your background in machine learning is quite helpful. I like to think it helps. I like to think it helps. I mean, um, there is a lot of noise. There is a lot of um, nuance in the space today and, you know, just being able to engage with our customers, right. And go, you know, uh, speak directly, right, one-on-one -on -one with a, you know, data scientist or or kind of a technical leader within our customers' organizations is certainly very, very helpful. So, um, yeah, you know, it, it's it's been a lot of fun um, in this role so far, at least at Snorkel. Got it. And how are you structuring the product team overall? Like, you know, um, is are there, like, different parts of the product that, like, you know, different people within the team focus on? Is like, kind of small right now and everyone does a bit of everything. Yeah, to be fully transparent, we're we're still a very small but mighty team at the moment. Um, but of course, we're we're starting to build out, you know, certain swim lanes in terms of how we think about ownership and uh, just general organization of of our product and R and D philosophy at large. You know, in broad strokes, the way I think about it is um, as as a layered stack, right? So we have our infrastructure layer. How do we actually get in the door in a compliant way? How do we actually scale to the compute needs of our customers um, in both on-prem, hybrid, and you know, cloud offerings? That's foundational to how we need to operate as a platform, and we need you know specific folks thinking about and owning that. Um, 
then I'd say there's kind of an enterprise readiness or kind of administration layer. Again, all of these features to make sure that whatever we get in the door with for our customers is compliant, is is uh, available so that um, it's governable, right? Within say a big bank versus insurance company, right? Lots of product thinking to do around um, the core enterprise readiness level. Um, and beyond that, you know, we think a lot about certain platform services, right? What does it actually look like to be foundation model first or LLM first, right? In this modern infrastructure stack, right? Lots of considerations when it comes to thinking about integrations and, and again, you know, implications of working on very different infrastructure settings within enterprise settings um, need to be thinking very closely about that. Um, and beyond those kind of core platform and infrastructure layers, I often think about then the workflows, right? What are data scientists and subject matter experts actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis? What is their workflow? What are their pain points and actually, you know, experiencing going zero to one from demo to to prototype to to uh, production? What, what what are they what are they actually facing on a day-to-day -day basis? And how do we leverage our core technology around programmatic data development, not just doing it manually or or in an ad hoc way? How do we leverage that to really accelerate these workflows? Um. So again, that's a kind of whole other set of modules that we need to think through. And then, of course, on top of that, you know, there's a lot of really interesting work we're doing around uh, making sure our core platform um, works very well across different use cases and say NLP, right? What what Snorkel looks like for PDF use cases versus computer vision versus generative AI use cases, um, you know, has some nuance um, and, and differences. So making sure that all of the pieces below it kind of roll up in a in a, in a really streamlined way, you know, is another way I think about um, organization here. So um, that's that's kind of a, a little bit of a deep dive into how I think about the team and just broadly R&D structure here. Um, but it all rolls up into our core um, data development platform, Snorkel Flow. Makes sense. You know, you touched on some really important points while answering this question that like, you know, a bunch of those I would like love to dive deep into. Some yeah. involve like you know what's happening with generative AI data labeling, like you know how is Snorkel doing? What, what's Snorkel doing in that in that aspect? But also you talked about uh, the programmatic data development bit, uh, which is obviously like you know one of the core uh, value props of of Snorkel as well, right? So would love to dive deeper into into those two. But before we go there, maybe one other question uh, at a higher level, especially like you know you're privy to this uh, journey given as as a founding engineer, right? Um, what are some initial, like, you know, when you started off, um, like navigating the journey of selling in this space, like who was like your initial ICP uh, that you all thought that you want to sell and has that evolved, like, you know, ideal customer profile, has that evolved over the years? Like, would love to understand that that actual overall startup journey. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, look, we we started as a research artifact, even back in the academic days. We had an open source library focused largely um on you know like standard research reproducibility right it was a research artifact something that other ml scientists or engineers would use to you know reproduce our work and um you know take that first step to applying it to their specific use cases certainly not something that say a data scientist at a at a fortune 5 bank could use and hit right. the ground running and meet all the enterprise you know requirements that they have um you know that was that was uh, something of a journey and something that we certainly iterated to to get to Thinking about our core technology, um, you know, one of the pieces that we started to, to realize, right, there are a few axes where we really stood out in terms of um, how we differentiated and how we could actually solve real needs within um, our, our possible user base, right? One of these was around really overcoming um, the, the bottlenecks of, of uh, just the volume of data you needed labeled to power these, you know, modern modern foundation models or, or deep learning models. Um, for a lot of folks that we worked with, simply getting, say, crowdsourced or manually annotated data points was a non-starter for their AI applications, right? These were settings where maybe there was, say, a compliance issue with sending data overseas, you know, mm -hmm. to get it crowd labeled. Maybe there was an expertise gap, right? Getting a doctor's time for a thousand, ten thousand hours is may you know quite quite frankly like uh, impossible in certain settings um and maybe there was a gap in terms of just general adaptability and and ability to kind of iterate right on data a lot of folks we talked to ended up realizing that hey anytime i want to make an update to my label schema or or update my spec a bit i have to start from scratch and this is something that 
is a, a real pain, you know, when it comes to sourcing these data sets. Yes. And so we really thought about the axes of differentiation for us, how we could apply programmatic labeling, which um, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more detail around in a second, um, to to a certain data development use cases and really anchored on a certain ICP in the enterprise that had all these problems, right? Tend to be proprietary data sets, tend to be mm -hmm. settings where, again, scale is quite important in order to um, deploy these models and get them into production. Um, tend to have, you know, some amount of, uh, uh, you know, expertise needed to actually inject into into their problems, and so really anchored on these these enterprise data science teams tied to again really mission critical high value uh, use cases. So a lot of a lot of iteration, you know, that that goes into some of that process, and of course we're still learning today, just given given where the market's at, but. Um, you know, it's certainly a fun journey going from, yep, this is just something you can play with as a, an academic artifact to, um, yes, this is something that resonates with with a real a real buyer in the enterprise. Makes sense. Absolutely. Um, thanks a lot for sharing that. And maybe like, you know, now is a good time to dive deeper into the programmatic data development aspect of it. Like, tell us a little bit more about what does that mean? What are the challenges um, that, that like, you know, people are facing that you're trying to solve the programmatic data development? And how is it just difficult to implement, maintain, like, you know, maintain this yourself? Yeah. What are the challenges in building this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. A lot of folks who start building AI, especially in enterprise settings, realize that, oh my gosh, the, the actual data set management and curation step of this workflow really amounts to just sending Excel sheets back and forth, you know, losing the versioning, restarting from scratch, and in some ways just not being able to start at all because of some of the reasons I mentioned earlier, right? You you can't you 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 can't get the data off prem to any sort of vendor because it's non compliant. You don't have the expertise um, that's scalable to actually label the amount of data you need. And again, it's just a very very ad hoc manual process that's quite painful and again a complete non starter for some projects. So in the enterprise, that's one of the kind of biggest bottlenecks and gaps that we saw. You know, eight years ago when we started the Snorkel project, and still today, you know, in the LLM era. Um, it's still very, very challenging to develop data into a high quality way that can be used to train these models. What mm. we mean when we say programmatic data development is we wanna make all this process, all this messiness that is dealing with Excel spreadsheets, we wanna make that process look a lot more like software development. We wanna make it so that you can actually, you know, write software, right, or encode certain rules or heuristics or um, pieces of rationale, encode it in software and have that scale. You know, so one very, very simple example that I like to like to use is, let's say you're trying to build a classifier for spam emails versus normal emails. Um, if you were to label this manually, you might go through a thousand, ten thousand, maybe millions of, of of emails and say spam, spam, not spam. You know, and yeah. and as you're going, you probably start to build rules or intuitions in your own head about what makes for a spam email and what makes for something that's normal. With Snorkel, what you would do is you'd encode all of those pieces of intuition as labeling functions. So as programmatic forms of supervision, you'd be able to say, hey, if there's a prescription drug name and you know we're not a pharmaceutical company, there's a prescription drug name in this email, I'm gonna label it spam. If there's a uh, you know mention of free money, you know, Probably also spam, right? If if it's my CEO asking for gift cards, you know, probably spam, um, unless they're in a really big pinch, right? And you can start developing these heuristics or rules or functions, right, encoded in software to actually label data at scale. Now you might ask, hey, this is this is a process where you know some of these rules might not be perfect, right? And that's exactly where a lot of our academic work and systems around weak supervision came in. A lot of the theory and fundamentals we built over at Stanford were all focused on how do you take these noisy sources of supervision and combine and aggregate them into training sets that scale and, and are denoised. And so long story short, by providing these labeling functions or these more programmatic forms of data operations uh, to our users, we're able to achieve a few benefits, right? One of them is scale. You're able to label a lot more data than you would be able to in, in, by just going manually. Another one is um, you get some of that inherent auditability, right, built in, right? You get to collaborate a little bit more closely and do that version control and do that change management in a way that looks a lot more like what you would with uh, Git and, and kind of software development. And so we start to see workflows where our customers are able to 
collaborate with their subject matter expert partners, right? And get input in a really efficient way and then turn that into training data sets. We're starting to see workflows where if you need to make a spec change in your label schema, you're actually able to do that without relabeling your entire data set. And you can do that by simply refactoring your labeling functions. And so that's just one example of how I think about programmatic development applied to, to labeling. All of these principles you know, generalize more broadly to all the different types of data ops you need to support, um, you know, modern data curation, instruction tuning workflows, you know, for, for LLMs or foundation models. And so at the end of the day, our mission here is to build that platform to make data development look a lot more like software development, right? So that you can get that scale, you can get that adaptability, that collaboration. Um, if we're successful, you know, we, we hope it'll mean that it becomes a lot easier to program AI uh, for, for enterprise settings. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, so, you know, do you uh, would you would you say that um, you know, like when enterprises use the programmatic data development, right? Like, I guess I was at when I was at Facebook, I personally faced this issue where when we are getting the label data back from the from the human annotators, basically, and I would realize that there are issues in the guidelines that I had provided to, provided them, right? And without mentioning a certain guideline, um, almost the entire data labeling effort would, it's essentially waste, right? Like, because I forgot to mention like one key ingredient in the guideline. How, how could like, you know, programmatic, uh, like, you know, data development in this case, solve something like this? Like if you have like, you know, seen one of the success stories where like in an enterprise spent like millions of dollars before they use Snarkle, and hey, right. like, you know, the, would, would love to hear a, a story like that, yeah. That, that's a great case study because it certainly happens and it's quite painful, yeah. um, you know, at least before before they're able to leverage Snorkel. Um, the, the way I think about that, you know, that, that's really a setting where the spec, the spec has changed, right? And to, exactly to your point, um, if you're labeling your data manually, every time your spec changes, you have to start from scratch, right? Now there's going to be label yeah. errors scattered throughout your data and it's, it's really a kind of zero to one effort all over again. With something in Snorkel, you're actually encoding your rationale and your spec into your data directly. So if you were to change, say, hey, I think this contract is a, you know, stock employment rather or a stock stock based, you know, document rather than an employment document, um, you can simply kind of change the code. You can change the kind of rationale in your labeling function. And it looks a lot more like refactoring your code, refactoring your labeling functions rather than say starting from scratch all over again. So that ends up being a very powerful development paradigm for our users as they start to see the process of iterating on data as, as something that's, again, far more adaptable and kind of iterative than um, pr previously, right? Where the data just kind of came over in Excel spreadsheets, um, was locked away by another team. Um, with something like Snorkel, you can really iterate far more quickly and uh, be, be flexible to changes in, in something like your label schema or spec, exactly as you said. Makes sense. And how do you encode some, some of the examples could be like extremely nuanced, right? Like, um, it, how, how, do, how do you encode something like that in a programmatic way? And when I say nuanced, I mean like, you know, this, uh, not like a very simple rule with which you can describe something. It's just like, you know, humans yeah. have to look at the data and tell like, you know, what's, what's happening here. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the, the nice thing about this abstraction is that it's quite flexible. You know, our, some of our, for example, in NLP settings, right, using keywords or using, you know, just pattern based regexes make a lot of sense, right, in terms of certain types yeah. of programmatic development. But the abstraction is quite flexible, right? It's really any sort of software or code that you write internally um, that outputs a specific label for some subset of data, you know, is, is, is really the kind of function signature, right, of of this labeling function abstraction. And so we end up having a number of different tools or templates within our platform focused on say, embeddings based, you know, similarity type um, labeling functions or natural language type labeling functions where you can really just explain or prompt a model to label in a certain direction. Um, the, the, the short answer is, yeah, I mean, it, it's just a quite flexible abstraction and it doesn't have to be patterns or keywords or, or rules, right? It can really be anything that's expressible in, in software, which Makes our customers and users certainly get quite creative around. Makes sense. Understood. Cool. Switching the gears towards the, the new world, right? Like the 
before chat gpt we talked a little bit about now like you know we we talked about a bc era now maybe talk about the after chat gpt era so yeah. um what's happening what type of use cases are you seeing more recently and how is how are llms helping or like you know i guess not helping your your business overall so the the two questions around chat gpt right um what are the newer use cases that you're seeing and what's the effect on the business yeah absolutely i mean it's it's um a really really exciting wave right i mean i think um the chat gpt era you know where uh, modern llms have taken us um really just has accelerated the field in a very very exciting way um the types of capabilities and demos that we see on on x or twitter right are are truly mind boggling um and in terms of use cases right um a lot of what we're seeing in the enterprise at least is that you know sure there's there are some use cases that again reminiscent of the ones you see on demo over public data sets over kind of demo level tasks um that that are you know effectively kind of zero to one right uh, solved in a pretty remarkable way but there's um a large you know fraction of use cases that are enterprise first right that that folks need to put into production that simply aren't solved out of the box you know by these by these llms and that's something that we're certainly seeing right these tend to be use cases that have say proprietary data backing them right so again these data sets are specific to a bank to an insurance company to you know a life sciences company and uh frankly are just not in the common crawl training distribution excuse me um that's one that's one class of kind of use cases that uh tends to be one where again these out of the box llms fall down at least in terms of production accuracy and then the the second is is where you know there's a really high bar for actually production accuracy right if you have a chatbot that sometimes falls down and says crazy things in a banking setting yeah, that's that sometimes is is a kind of <laughs> you know a, a binary right for a big financial services institution and so um that's one way that i think a lot about the types of use cases in the space today right one axis is really um how bespoke is the data is the use case you know how task specific is it and t- the second axis is um how high is the production accuracy quality and the more you go up into the right right the more you go higher accuracy more bespoke more task specific um the more you know we're we're seeing a need for folks to actually customize and and build um uh build build data sets right for these models to train or or fine tune or adapt them um in in a way that works for their business so in terms of how we're thinking about this um you know we're seeing the ai hype cycle crest a bit right last year was the year of um and maybe this is a hot take i'm not sure to i haven't caught up with kind of where the twitter sentiment has been these days but we're starting to see a lot of the excitement around say pocs around prototypes right with big foundation model vendors start to crest from last year right folks are starting to realize hey for our enterprise use cases where we really want to get to production fast we need more than simply kind of prompt engineering right to get to that production quality and that's where again we've seen a lot of really big excitement around hey what does it actually mean for folks to focus on data development you know to specialize models that work in production settings whether that's instruction tuning fine tuning whether that's actually distilling you know these foundation models or llms into form factors that are far more efficient for for inference and serving those are all types of use cases that we've seen strong upticks in again just based on where the market's at and again from a first principles perspective it makes sense that there's going to be that class of use cases in enterprise settings that um need specialization in order to reach production got it so from what i'm hearing is like you know this is more about enterprises are trying to unlock use cases and to get the desired level of performance they need some sort of data labeling uh, which is where like you know you're seeing more of the use cases more of the i guess usage of the platform um you're not seeing many enterprises trying to do like let's say an rlhf or like you know train one of their models from scratch which also involves like a bunch of data labeling uh, right now in in their own setting basically Is it's a good right? question we we see a bit of both i mean um a lot of the problems you know a good portion of the use cases we see tend to be more of the fine tuning instruction tuning right you you leverage an existing open source based model which we're very big fans of right we're we're big believers in the open source movement here um you know you leverage one of those and then kind of fine tune for task specific performance over 
you know, an enterprise problem that matters to your organization. That's one big use case we see. We do also see some settings that we've we've worked with some customer uh, that, that that some of our customers have leveraged our platform for, where the focus is on actually building better shared representations, right? So closer to the pre-training side of the world, how do you actually maybe take a number of you know task-specific objectives or curate data sets that you know, generally apply to a number of tasks and fine tune or even train from scratch a base representation that will be reused across a number of tasks. So um, it tends to be the case that folks have shifted right a little bit, you know, or they tend to try, hey, let's fine tune, you know, first before say pre-training from scratch, just because it's far more expensive. Um, But, you know, some folks are certainly thinking a little bit about, um, hey, what is, what does it mean for me to own some set of, you know, base representation that um, will, you know, Help me rise the tide to lift all my boats, per se. Got it. I see. Understood. Makes sense. Makes sense. Then how about, like, you know, the the impact on the business? Like, because from what I understand, like, you know, LLMs have, of course, made data labeling a lot easier than it used to be. Um, a lot of people are able to use literally LLMs to generate data sets for them. So does this uh, positively impact your business? Does this negatively impact your business? What's What's the take? It's a great question. I mean, the LM wave has been great for us, right? I mean, for for a few reasons. One, you know, um, the need for data development more broadly than simply labeling is is ever present, right? The need to really not just label data, but curate the right subsets to filter out bad examples, right? To um, define evaluation slices or, or benchmarks, right? To really make sure that your models work well when they're in production settings. All these different types of data operations um, beyond labeling, right, are are very, very important, right, to these enterprise settings. And the general need to kind of build training data sets, evaluation data sets to um, make sure that these models work well in the production and can be specialized, right, is also ever present. And so, you know, um, I, I give the labeling example as as just kind of one example of the type of operation that we we support here at Snorkel, but more broadly, you know, um, our our focus is is on kind of data development and um, taking our users on that entire journey, which um, you know of course is is uh, uh, very very critical. One piece that I'll kind of dig even deeper into is that the actual process of evaluating and benchmarking LLMs is. Um, Unfortunately, more of more of an art than a science these days, and that's one thing that we think a lot about here at Snorkel. One thing that we believe is is one of our strengths as well. You know, in order to drive that feedback loop, right? The the key pieces of our workflow are really, hey, how do you detect errors? How do you find the hot spots in your data? Right. One of the key data centric ops is actually error analysis, right? Figuring out, hey, where do I need to focus in order to get the most bang for my buck in terms of annotator time, in terms of labeling time, in terms of data science time. That's one huge start, part, start, uh, part of the workflow in addition to the error correction or you know, data development step. And so that, that error analysis step, I think, is still um, underrepresented in, you know, say, kind of Twitter conversations. And it's something that we, we uh, you know, have partnered with a number of customers on to really mature how they think about, you know, developing their AIML workflows, right? So again, we view that as very, very data centric, that process of what does it look like to actually find errors in your data set? And it's something that, you know, there's been a, a huge spike in interest around uh, just given kind of where the Gen AI wave is at these days. Very interesting. You know, this error analysis bit, Vincent, a lot of our customers ask us uh, error analysis in the context of RAGs. Um, mm. generation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you seeing a lot of those those use cases as well um, in terms of evaluating and, and analyzing the responses, et cetera? Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the th- one of the pieces here that I think gets gets a little muddled today is you know, when we think about evaluating language models, I think there's there's an inclination to just say, "Hey, end to end, I'm just going to evaluate the final output and yeah. call it call it a day." Right? But one of the principles that we have really followed since since you know before the LLM era is the idea that you need to think about your ML or AI applications as systems, not just models. And this applies in the LLM world as well. So, um, one one um, principles that extends to LLM land today is really the idea of LLM system tuning, right? It's not just about tuning that final LLM. Um, you also need to evaluate and tune the individual components, right? If you have a RAG system, there's a retrieval component to that, right? You can use um, 
uh, you know, decades and decades of literature and kind of methods to actually evaluate and, and tweak those those types of systems um, before they go into the final kind of LLM piece, right? Which maybe takes some of that context. There might be um, other parts of your pipeline that are focused on evaluation, right? Where you're building models for the purpose of evaluation. And that might need to be uh, tweaked as well, right? Um, and, and tuned uh, based on your specific data set. So every part of the pipeline here, we're seeing um, as, as something that needs some amount of evaluation and tuning. We call this general phenomenon, kind of LLM system tuning at large. And it's not really a special idea. It's really just the idea that to build, you know, enterprise ready or production ready systems, you need to, you know, uh, uh, revisit principles of modularity, right? And kind of, deco uh, uh, you know, proper abstraction and kind of decomposition in order to really, you know, get these, get these pieces into production. You shouldn't just think about the model as one end-to-end -end monolith. It's really about, thinking about these as systems of components as well. Got it. And so in this case, you would actually help people evaluate, let's say, RAG across different components of the stack as well. So like the embedding layer or the indexing layer or the data parsing layer, et cetera. Is that, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, we've worked with uh, customers on use cases where you know, um, we've tuned multiple parts of their, of their LLM system, right? We maybe help them with standard information extraction, right? Once you actually, you know, retrieve the relevant documents, how are you pulling out the right pieces of metadata, you know, to actually inform the, the LLM at the end of the day? We might help them with the retrieval section, right? Which is more about pulling the right documents in the first place. And so each step there, you know, um, again, pulls on kind of a pretty rich, rich um, corpus of, of literature slash standard techniques. And so um, in in the broad scope of where LLMs are today, I think there, there's an exciting opportunity to again, revisit these principles of modularity and component level testing and, and iteration um, more so than say end to end, you know, I'm just going to treat this as a, as a black box that I don't open up. Got it. Okay. Very nice to hear this. Um, Vincent, I'm going to, I'm going to switch gear one more time and like, you know, yeah, sure. talk a little bit about um, the exciting things that are happening. Like, you know, all of us like are super excited about what's happening in AI and many people are talking about different trends that are emerging. Given how close you are to the space, are you seeing some trends that are emerging, which you are excited about, but people are just not talking about enough, anything that's a bit underrated according to you? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I'll start with something that I think is maybe properly rated and then and then kind of give my own spin on it. I, you know, we're we're big believers in the kind of open models, open data movement today. I'd like to think that this is non-controversial, but um, the whole idea that, hey, you build, you know, safer systems um, in an open source way, you kind of get to reprodu reproducibility faster, you accelerate the field faster, right, through through open systems. That's that's something that we believe in strongly here at Snorkel. Um, and, and you know, I, I, I know there are others out there that believe that too. Um, so maybe that's not so much a a kind of unpopular opinion. Maybe the piece or, or nuance here that, that I see with this is that the real way you open source these models is not just by releasing weights, it's by releasing the data sets, right? And ideally the kind of rationale, comments, label schema, all the pieces of the stack that are needed to actually build those data sets, that should be released in open source too, right? I view the source code for modern AI models as the data, right? The data is the source code. And if you really want to be serious about um, open sourcing these models, it's not just about Hey, here are here are a bunch of kind of floats, you know, that that are associated with the with the model outputs and weights. It's also about taking the the raw labels, the data sets, the rationale, the the kind of docs, you know, that kind of specified all of that, and and putting that out there as well, because that all went into the process of actually developing that model. So that's one trend that I'm quite excited about. Um, you know, there are there are folks um, in the open source community that have pushed for this you know, open data movement as well. But it's something that, of course, we believe in uh, strongly here at Snorkel in terms of how we think about programming, programming AI at large. Nice. That's a that's a very, very interesting point out there. Um, tell us a bit more about this. Maybe I'm going to double click on this a little bit more. So like, let's say, I, I get the point about the data, like an you know, open sourcing data would, would definitely um, can be used in many different interesting ways, right? You also mentioned about how you got from the data that you had to the model basically, right? Or like, you know, the, the process of, I guess, creating and curating the data set as well. Tell us a bit more right. about what are interesting use cases that you see unlocking and how the open source community would benefit from each other's work um, by, by doing this. 
Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a great question. There, there's a lot, and again, this is a very snorkely way to think about it. But there's a lot of, um, the, there are a lot of artifacts or kind of you know pieces of software that go into building data sets, right? At least that's our view, or that's that's how it should be. You know, there are evaluation sets, unit tests, or what what I like to call slices of your data set that need to be mm. defined as you know measures of hey, is this actually good enough to reach production quality? Right? Um, there's been an exciting uptick of evals that have been open sourced recently in the LLM era. Um, but that's one area where, again, for safety reasons, for quality reasons, um, more movement here will absolutely accelerate the field. Um, there, there are other artifacts around, hey, what did you actually do to filter out bad examples, right? What did you actually do to curate uh, your, your data to make it work for your specific use case? What did you actually do to kind of label or add more metadata to your data um, based on other sources of knowledge you had in your stack. Again, all of these are programmatic pieces of signal um, that 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 um, you know, at least for these open models, right, are are quite valuable in terms of pulling back the surface and understanding what did it actually take to get to these get to some of these base models. So, um, you know, that's that's kind of one view that I have around how to how to think about all the ingredients that go into actually building one of these models beyond simply, again, the kind of floats that go in a a uh, a pickle of weights. Absolutely wonderful. Completely makes sense. Just one last question, um, Vincent. Um, so you have like navigated your journey from like you know being in academia to working and leading like you know teams at a very very innovative startup in the machine learning field, and now riding the uh, generative AI wave as well, right? Um, what's your advice for somebody who's starting their career in AI? around now around this time like anything that you that you want people to focus on or you want people to not focus on yeah that's a great question i think that the thing that i've always focused on and that i always hearken back to is um, it's just really important to build and get your hands dirty. And I don't just mean, hey, hackathon, you know, 24 hours, get a demo out there. I think the bar is far higher these days with AIML. Build something that, you know, you're excited about using, that um, you'll come back to week over week, that you understand has edge cases, that you're writing down those edge cases, and they're really trying to address to make the experience better for yourself. Um, I think that's what it's going to take for us to really cross the chasm here in terms of, okay, this is a cool demo I can put onto Twitter to, okay, this is actually something that's robust, that's production ready, that I understand is is a set of constraints that need to be um, addressed before I can actually put this in, into production. Building that intuition, I think, um, is is super, super critical to, I think, being an, an, an effective ML practitioner um, in today's day and age. And maybe surprisingly, I think doing that will actually put someone far, far ahead of where folks are today, right? Actually getting one's hands dirty and thinking through some of these nuances is un, untrodden territory, right? In, in, in a lot of cases, um, there's been, you know, lots and lots of research about how to train these models and how to, how to, you know, scale these pieces up. But, um, the interaction models, the UI UX, some of the nuances around how you actually, um, you know, align these models. A lot of that is uncharted territory, and uh, the the best way to learn and get to the bleeding edge is to really build and ideally build with kind of other people who are uh, just as excited as you are. So um, maybe a little bit generic, but you know, certainly a set of heuristics that I I follow as well as you know, we're all quite early in this space, so um, keeping makes that learner's sense. mindset is is uh, still lots of fun. Makes makes a ton of sense. Some things are time tested, and they they just. Uh, they, yeah. I guess, yeah. stand the test of time, right? And this is this is definitely one of those. Um, cool. Thank you so much, Vincent, for taking the time and sharing, like you know, your learnings, your experience with 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 the listeners here, with our audience. Uh, I'm sure they have tons and tons of things to learn from from this episode. Uh, really appreciate it. No, thank you so much, Nikun, for for having me. Really enjoyed the chat, and um, yeah, big fan of uh, your your work and podcast here. Great. Thank you.